My name is Sonia, and today I will be talking about converting coroutine into an ice stream. Yes, the ice stream that you normally use to parse lines from a file, for example. So an ice stream is a higher level abstraction. It allows you to read the string, an integer, right? You also have a get line, which gets an ice stream. So you have higher level functionality implemented by ice stream, but it operates on top of stream buffer. A stream buffer is a ring buffer. It goes around. So what happens is iStream is reading the characters from this ring buffer. And when it reads all the characters in that buffer, so the ring buffer makes a full rotation and it reaches the point where you started, you need to fill in the new, new data from somewhere. And for file stream, the data would be from files. So the files fstream, ifstream, is pushing bytes from a file into the ring buffer. In our case, what we're going to do, we're going to feed the data from generator. So let's see how this works. So this is my test for a generator that I will be using to populate my stream buffer. A stream buffer has a ring buffer of fixed size. And you can see in this test, I'm generating those fixed size uh, arrays out of this generator. However, Inside the generator, the code produces variable length text. So what happens here is this gets yielded into that generator. Generator then do, does something to it. And then when stream buffer wants to get next ring buffer filled in, it will get you know, some fragment, like for example, this fixed size array, right? So when the stream buffer experiences underflow, which means it's, it's all, the, all the data from the ring buffer was read, we need to fill in the ring buffer, right? So to fill in the ring buffer, it will call out to my generator. And we remember my generator produced variable and strings, right? But my stream buffer wants this amount of bytes to fill in ring buffer. It could be the full size of ring buffer, it will be, if that's the case, then we have all same size all the time. But it can be some fragment of the ring buffer that it needs to fill in, right? So in this test case, I'm testing that I'm reading same size fragments all the time, okay? I'm filling my temporary buffer with dot, so I can see that if there is no data, there is a dot, just, just for my visual, you know, ability to see what's going on. My buffer has five five spaces in it. So I'm reading five at a time. And here I'm reading these five characters from my generator. So my generator in this case has a read method, which takes a pointer to, 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 to array and the size of array, and it reads next, you know, size of, of characters into that array. That's what my generator is doing. So to recap, on the generator side, on the coroutine side, I'm just pushing co using coil those variable and text. But on the consuming side, I'm reading these buffers, this fixed size five element buffers. And you can see that I'm expecting this sort of thing happening inside you know, ring buffer, right? So we're going to be filling in just five characters you know, from, from all those strings concatenated together. So let's see if it actually works first. So let's build it. Okay, it's built. And test, all my tests pass. And this is my test that we're looking at, generator iStream, it works, okay? So tests pass, meaning that we get those expected values for my stream test and for my generator test, the tests are successful. Let's see what the implementation looks like. Let's see what the implementation looks like for those, those things. How did I implement iStream generator? And how did I implement generator iStream? Maybe let's take a look from the top to bottom. So on the top would be generator iStream. That's an iStream implementation using a generator, right? Generator iStream. So I'm using it here right, in generate text stream in this test. Now, let's look at the code. 
So this is this is generator iStream. You can see that I have put template parameters, same as an iStream would have, so that we have the same flexibility. So we have also character type and traits for, for this character type, right? And by default, I'm using the ones that are default in iStream. So I could put here the value from iStream as it is there defined, but I decided to use the default from iStream, whatever that is, right? Now, what we have here is a constructor, which takes this generator type from user and creates this generator iStream buffer as a member variable, right? From this, from this generator, okay? We move generator into constructor of generator iStream buffer. This generator iStream is what we are returning here from this coroutine. So you can see that compiler automatically turns this into a coroutine that is then constructing generator iStream. How does this all work together, right? It's an interesting question. So compiler looks for this promise type defined in the class. Okay, so when I say, you know, this coroutine returns generator iStream, compiler will look into generator iStream for a promise type. But the promise type is actually not defined inside this generator iStream. I have defined it somewhere else in generator type, which I define as iStream generator charity type traits. This iStream generator, as we remember, I tested in my previous test, in this one here. Right? So this is actually a generator, this guy. And this is our test for it. But here, we're going to use it implicitly inside this generator iStream, which will create uh, you know, an instance of it, you know, here as a member, okay? So let's look at this generator iStream. What is this generator iStream? So here is generator iStream buffer. Let me move myself a little bit. So we can see the generator iStream buffer is basic stream buffer. So this is the implementation of the ring buffer from iStream that I'm overriding to supply it with data from my generator. So you can see that this thing itself is not generator. This thing itself is not a generator, right? So let's go back. So we have this constructor of our iStream, generator iStream, that takes a generator type. So what needs to happen here from C++ perspective? We have the generator text stream. We have this coroutine, we have this type. What compiler will make out of it, if we look into this class, we'll look for promise type, which is generator pr type promise type. Then it will go here, iStream generator, and it will look for this promise type here. And then this iStream generator is returned as an object, right? So this is what gets returned. Now, this would be the return type from here, but it's not. It is this class instead. So what happens next is this iStream generator gets passed into a constructor, into an, an implicit constructor of this class, okay? So what happens, we call this constructor, and this constructor will take this generator type, right? This iStream generator it will take it and will construct generator iStream buffer. And then generator iStream buffer, if we look at it, also takes this as constructor parameter and moves it, right? It moves it to its local variable. And then in the field buffer, which is my private function, I'm using it, generator read. We already know that generator read is gonna do the job, right? If we look at the test, the generator read is reading those, those fragments. So we see how this all glues together, right? So let's go back. We have this coroutine. It's our test coroutine generate text stream. We yield here some text. That text, when it gets yielded, makes compiler produce a coroutine and it needs to find what is the promise type in this generator iStream. The promise type in generator iStream generator type promise type. So we look there, 
And this is the promise type. And this promise type returns iStream generator as an object. Then this gets used to construct generator iStream because this is the return type of this function here, right? And the construction of this type causes construction of stream buffer. So we forward this G into the stream buffer. I don't forward, I actually move, okay? In this case, because I pass by value. I was considering using the forwarding reference and move forwarding it, but I came to conclusion the use case in this case would be move because here we get this generator created by compiler for us. It is an expiring value no matter what. So we want to move it, that's it. We want to move it. Compiler will move it into this by value type and we keep moving it into stream buffer and then stream buffer will move it into this generator, right? So it's like moving it. Now, next question is, how is this generator working? You have seen, I scrolled through a lot of code there, right? Because it's complicated. And I don't know if I want to bore you to death with the implementation details of this generator, but let's look at some top level things. So stream generator is just a class, okay? I made it a template with same parameters as my iStream. Now, if we scroll a little bit, we have a promise type. And in generator before, let me show you the generator before so we can see the analogy from here to the generator before. This one is from CPP reference, almost copy paste. I did a few changes, okay? So the promise type is the, the guy who stores the last value. So the last value you yielded, it's here in this value, right? And, and, and the yield value simply assigns this value you yielded into this storage. Then when you want to read this generator from generator next value, here it is implemented as an operator, um, you know, call operator, right? So you call that generator and you get the next value. This is how this is done. And in this generator, it stores just one element. So you yield one element and you read back that element. But in our case, we're doing something quite different. Let me go back to the test. So in both cases, whether it's a generator test or high stream test, I'm yielding the whole string of variable length, right? But the high stream is a thing that operates on single characters. So I'm not yielding single characters here. I'm yielding the whole string and I can yield that as many times as I like. So what happens? How does it even work? And also you have noticed that I'm calling here a, a read of multiple, of size. So I might have yielded this amount of characters. I don't know how many there is, 20 or so, but I'm reading five. And next time I'm calling, I'm calling read, I'm reading another five. So this reads, you don't have one-to-one -one relationship between these reads and this yields, right? In the previous, in the, nor in the normal generator, you would have a like, gen generator give me next item and that causes a generator to make another iteration and yield you one next item. In this case, it's different. I'm yielding whole fragment of text. And here I'm reading just fragment of this text. However, if I'm reading more than this fragment, that may cause multiple yields. So there could be a situation that in order for me to read these five characters, I will not yield anything. I will just read from that ring buffer that's already populated. But maybe I'm reading 100 characters and maybe I don't have 100 characters in, in the ring buffer. And, you know, maybe, you know, we, we keep reading from that buffer. Buffer gets replenished from our generator internal things. And then there is a moment where we need to yield again another text, right? It's a little bit complicated. So let's look at this promise type here. What does it have? It has a list of arrays, a list of arrays. Why did I make it a list of arrays? And how does it actually work? I don't know if I can easily explain that. Let's go back to the test. If I'm yielding tomorrow another day, okay, 
and I intend to use a ring buffer of size five. Then I can create a list of arrays. Each of those arrays is size of five. Okay, that's that's what I can do. Next thing I do is when I'm yielding this tomorrow another day, I chop this text automatically into arrays of size five. So I'm creating as many arrays as necessary to store tomorrow another day. I could just create an array of size of this text and store this whole thing, right? But I think it's going to be more efficient if you have fixed size arrays, because now this could potentially be, a, you could have a free list with those arrays. And at the end of the day, it is a stream that you, at the end of the day, read bytes and you read it completely differently than you are populating it. You are, you are pushing in bigger strings and now you're reading smaller strings, right? So in the full, full test case of an I stream, you see, this is what I'm reading. I was pushing, uh, I was pushing those texts, those texts, right? To that day, today, tomorrow, another day, right? All this, but I'm reading just words. In this case, I'm reading just words, right? So imagine you can use this solution to, um, to yield out the, uh, some, some example, some case, some something, right? A fixed message. <laughs> And then on the on the consuming side, you can use my iStream message parser. Okay, so you can yield fragments of that message, and then on the other side, you can just parse it. Isn't that cool? Like now, I'm not hundred percent sure if there is such a great usage for it, because you probably would be receiving this message from you know network and it was probably one big buffer with the whole message in it over some some protocol so yeah this is this is just a you know implementation of how we wrap generator into an i stream and the usefulness of this solution is you know up to you to decide what can be done with it maybe it's useful for writing unit tests Maybe, maybe you just want to co-yield some text as you write, as you do unit tests. Why not? Um, yeah. Alternatively, you know, alternatively, you can just use string stream. Instead of doing that, you can just create a string stream, put those texts into string stream, and then just read them back in and you achieve the same result. <laughs> I thought it would be fun to try having a generator producing you an I stream, right? It's it's just a you know, a case study, let's call it. So I have this list of buffers. I'm using a list of buffers and I'm being a little bit lazy here. So I don't have a free list. So what I'm doing, I'm allocating new buffers every time I need one. And I'm erasing from the list every time I don't need one. So theoretically, I could be allocating something new on the heap and destroying something on the heap all the time instead of like reusing the buffers that I no longer use. And it, we remember that stream is working in the ring buffer fashion. So I would definitely be reusing some of those buffers. So having a free list here, maybe as an allocator to this list, could be an allocator here, a free list, that would be probably more sensible solution to, to put here an allocator with free list. And we could use freeze because this is a fixed size. So it's a perfect case for the freeze. Now, let's see how the yield value works. I need to move myself, or maybe I'll shrink myself a bit. OK, but now we can see the code. Let's look at the code. So here's the yield value. We have a begin and, and size of our slice that we're putting in. So you can see that I'm using slice type here. What is the slice type? I'm using a string view. Why not? Right? Because why, why should it be a string? String view is better, no? And in this case, this is a perfect string view. It's just, you know, it has its size, it has its starting pointer. Why not to use a string view? And it can have zeros in it, I suppose. So that's what we do here, a loop. I'm not going to go over this loop because it took me a lot of time to make it work correctly. <laughs> There's some chopping happening so that as we remember, I need to chop this into some sizes buffers, but it has to be dynamic because, you know, here I'm just reading 
five elements. But what if I was reading like I was seven, five, two, one, and and then everything gets moved away. You know, it's it's no it's not your your reads are no longer aligned. You're, you're no longer reading those buffer from from this free list, right? This free list has buffers of size, let's say five. And, uh, you know, if you're reading size of five all the time, then yes, you will all, only ever have maybe, and, and if, you, if, you're, if you're reading and writing size of five, if, if you put putting here size of five or, you know, multiple of size five, like 10 or 15 size arrays, then, um, then yeah, then then you would end up having it's all aligned. Your reads and writes are have aligned sizes, but they're not aligned. Usually they're not, and in this case they're definitely not because you see this this is not divide. This this has some length. This has some length, and our buffers have size of, and in this case they have size of buffer size default, which is sixteen. In my case, just I choose some random number. So you know some of those texts may fit in the buffer, some others may not. Now imagine that I'm fitting this text in a buffer of size 16, and then I didn't fill in the whole buffer. So I'm fitting this buffer, this text straight after this one, right? So my buffer of size 16 gets filled with this. After this goes that, after this goes that, maybe that gets broken because I feel it's like 16 characters somewhere here. And then some, some next buffer gets created from here in the middle of the world and so on, right? So th this, these buffers that are here, they in no way aligned in size or anything with the input that we're putting in or the output, the reads, okay? Or the reads, this five is not aligned with 16. So it, it is not, 16 is not divisible by five by any means. <laughs> so it will definitely go like in places of a buffer. So I have this loop here that does the magic to chop the input into multiple buffers and fill in the fragments and take into account that last filled in buffer is not fully filled. And then I also have this calculation of how many characters are currently available. And this calculates over all, over all those buffers that we have in, in our list, right? It's a very simple calculation. It doesn't do any loops. It's smart calculations that multiplies the buffer size by number of buffers minus one plus current uh, write position minus read position, right? So this is this is actually cool. And then we have a read. And you can see the read itself is an interesting long function. Okay. I made one mistake, and I will admit to this mistake now. I don't know if you can see it. Okay. So here's the mistake. Copy count. That should be multiplied by size of this. Because, you know, I'm using memcopy. And memcopy, because... We're working on bytes, and the most efficient way to copy bytes is probably something like memcopy or something like even more specialized. You can use MMX or something else, but this should be size of the thing, and I should change that immediately. So perhaps I should put here uh, size of, and the type is this type. And I just put here this. This is how much we need to copy of in because my copy works on bytes. And our character can be white character, for example. What if, what if we work on white characters? Right? So so yeah, so this the available is in, in, in characters, it's not in, in bytes. It's just the, the, the mem copy. The mem copy itself needs to be you know, done like this. That's that's what we need to do. It is, it is unsafe. Well, we're shooting ourselves in the foot if we want to, but uh, yeah, that's that's what we, what we need to do here. So make test, test pass. So I didn't break anything. Yeah, good. I know how to use side of, all right. So at the end, we erase the buffers that we read fully, right? So we might have had the first buffer on the list will be read until a certain point. So that part we no longer read in the next read, but there is some portion that we still need to read starting from. So once we read it, this buffer is to be erased from the buffers list. And then every next buffer that we go over, and then the last buffer we read up until the read the right pointer. So if the last buffer is written until this place, we can only read until this place. 
right? And of course, we can read less. So we can be, we need to be smart how much we erase. And this is kind of interesting because do we erase first buffer? Do we erase the last buffer? How many buffers in between we erase? And it's all interesting math here yeah, going on. So, so this is our read. Now, so, so this is my promise type. So you see that my promise type stores the list of buffers, of fixed size buffers. My promise type has a yield value, which allows you to dump in the next value. So this is your next value. I just dump it in. And this yield value will chop it into pieces and put it in those buffers on the list. And then this has also available, which is a function to just give you how many items are available, characters, white characters, normal characters, whatever, in the buffers. And then you have a read to read the amount of characters into your destination buffer, right? So now, how does the, uh, you know, how does the stream, um, iStream buffer work, right? iStream buffer, um, stores this generator type. So we're talking about promise type. Promise type is defined inside of this uh, iStream generator, but we're storing this iStream generator. So we're calling read on this iStream generator. And here we go. The iStream generator is constructed from coroutine handle, which is important. And then, you know, the, the read here, right? The read here does the fill which is the same thing we did for normal generator. But in this case, we fill a count of, of characters. So that may actually return immediately because maybe, you know, we didn't, it, it, the, the whole idea is that we fill in, we need to generate new. If you already read everything, you know, if we need to, or, or if we have less in the ring buffers that, uh, that we need. So then we need to generate more. So you can see the field will call this coroutine whenever needed, as long as what we requested. So from the outside, we request some number of characters to be read. So we guarantee that after fill, we do have this amount of characters in this promise. So across all those lists that we also, sorry, across all those arrays in this list, we will have this amount of characters all together, right? So, so if I glue all these buffers in this list, starting from the read position in the last buffer, um, then I'll have enough characters to be read in, in, this, uh, in this case. So this available will tell us how many characters are between these two positions in all those buffers. And then, you know, after this happens, my coroutine calls are complete. So say I needed to fill in as many bytes, so I did these two coils, right? So these two coils could have happened the moment I was doing this loop. So every time this loop iterates, so we're, going, we're doing a yield. This is one yield, so we might be doing multiple yields. I mean, we might be doing zero yields. It depends how many are already in the promise. We may not have generated as many characters as were requested. Maybe generator just, you know, exited, no more. So we need to take the minimum between what is available and what we requested. If there is anything we can read, read it, and return how much we read. Very simple, right? So that's our read. Now, this is our iStream generator, and this is what we use in our iStream buffer, okay? In iStream buffer, this iStream generator is passed into constructor, as we remember, it's stored here. And we use it in field buffer, which is our function we use on different uh, overloads of, of the stream buff, okay, of basic stream buff. So basic stream buff has these virtual methods. It has an underflow, uflow, uh, pback fail, those three methods. So we need to do something in those methods. And basically field buffer with, uh, you know, is missing with missing data. And we call this generator read to fill the buffer. So we also have to have this buffer here that we that is fixed there, that doesn't go anywhere because stream uh, stream buff, okay, this class will be accessing this 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 buffer, this place. Okay. So 
this class actually doesn't carry an amplifier. It only has pointer, read pointer, and write pointer. And because this is I stream, it only uses the read pointer. It will not be using write pointer. And uh, yeah, so we, we, we set here where the current read pointer position in this buffer is, right? We just we just tell this stream stream of that this is where where my where my read pointer is and how many how many bytes are there in this in this buffer to be read. And then of course this i stream buffer is uh, something on top of which generator i stream lives, and then the generator i stream is something that we return from our coroutine. So this whole mechanism works magically inside. And you know, and it works. So the solution works, as you've seen, the uh, tests are passing. Um, that's an interesting uh, solution. Not sure how usable that is for like what use cases that could have. Um, yeah, so like, subscribe, comment. And yeah, see you again. Um, we're doing another video and I'll be talking about more interesting things in C20 and 20.